Thank you, Tom, Trey. Thank all of you for attending. It's not very often that I speak to an institute with so many people, so many students. And I appreciate it very much. Thank you, Tom, Mike. Uh, this is, uh, as you've heard, it's going to be a big burden on all of us. You younger generation have to realize what you're going to be faced with, and perhaps your children and grandchildren also. I want to thank also uh, my friends I see here, Kenji. Thank you very much. This is a man that has peace, walk, peace walks around the world. He comes through the Yakma Reservation on his way to Hanford with a group and we allow him to stay in our longhouse. And we appreciate his efforts, and we appreciate many efforts to try to bring to the, to the realization to everyone as to what the problem is here at the oldest and largest nuclear facility in this country, and now the largest public works facility. They're claiming they're going to clean it up. They claimed that a long time ago. And there are statistics you should be aware of. And I'm going to read something Tom Carpenter and Mr. Bob Alvarez put together clear back in 2002. <clears throat> Over the past 50 years, some 440 billion gallons of contaminated liquids were directly disposed to the ground. Enough to create a poisonous lake the size of Manhattan, 120 feet deep. This alone makes Hanford the most contaminated zone in the Western Hemisphere. These tanks you saw, they used to cascade, fill one and go on to the next, next. Eventually, if they got to the end, they still had a bunch left over. They'd dig a trench, put a pipe out there, and run it out there. And now that stuff has leaked down into the, into the Vado system, the Vado zone, which is between the surface and the groundwater. In the 200 area, the groundwater is 300 feet deep. Some of this material leaking out of those tanks has already reached the groundwater and is heading to the Columbia River. In one little area along the Columbia River, for instance, there are 115 springs coming up into the river. Plus, you've got a backwash of high, when the high water hits. That water backs up two miles back into Hanford. And eventually, when the water drops on the river, you've got a new wash of material going back into the river. So we have a magnificent problem. And some of you may wonder, why is the Akuma Nation involved? As perhaps most of you may know, we have a treaty with the United States of America, a contract that we feel is, as, uh, is going to suppose to last until the end of time. Not the little words at the bottom, uh, or 90 days, whichever comes first. <laughs> so, I became aware of what happened, what was happening in uh, Hanford in 1977, wherein they had already studied Hanford for a year. And what they were going to consider was to bring all the waste from the world to Hanford, and make it the repository. And set the site aside for 250,000 years. And put up markers to allow no one to go there and dig or farm or whatever. But as they tried to claim in the institutional controls matter, you and I know that these markers are not gonna last. A fence doesn't last long. 
uh, all materials, whether it be granite or rock or something, cement will deteriorate. And so, with that consideration then, we, the Yakima, became aware, at least I did, and started to try to determine what was, is at Hanford, and I couldn't get an answer. I wanted to know what is coming through our reservation on Highway 97, leaving Hanford and what was coming through Hanford, and by all means of transportation, I could not get an answer. And with this limited time, I'm going to jump forward. We were the only tribe to testify before a Senate subcommittee in January of 1980. And from that point, the only tribe to contribute to the parent legislation that became the Nuclear Waste Policy Act of 1982, in which we put the CNC, the, the, the consultation and coordination with Indian tribes that have a special interest there before anything major was done. And so we were finally elated when they passed the act in 1982. We immediately filed for effective status and received it by April of 1983. Congress passed the act on December 22nd of 82. In January 7th of 83, President Reagan signed it. The Bureau of Indian Affairs finally allowed us to be known as an effective tribe in 19, April of 1983, which meant we were eligible for funds from the commercial uh, production of electricity. They had to pay one mill, which is about a third of a cent, one mill into that fund to try to find a repository. As many of you know, it came down to eventually three sites in the country out of nine, and that was Depthness County in Texas, uh, the Yucca Mountain site in Nevada, and Hanford. Well, we finally showed that technically Hanford was not the place to put this material. So they decided on Yucca Mountain. And now that President Obama refused to fund Yucca Mountain, at the request of the uh, head of the Democratic Party, Mr. Reed, a senator from Nevada. Now we have nowhere for this material to go. At the same time, then, the Department of Energy is considered reclassifying this material. In 1952, the National Academy of Scientists says you have to put this stuff where it is not accessible at least 1,200 feet underground. But now you have this material near the surface of the earth, including what's in these tanks you saw. And they're considering reclassifying it, reclassifying that material to justify burying this material here near the surface of the earth, which is going to continue to compound the situation on into the future. And what day is it that there is going to be another leak, an explosion. In the late 80s and early 90s, 101SY was burping. It started to burp every 120 days. When it got down to burping every 90 days, they become very concerned. And they devised half-ton trucks to go sit on top of the tank have events coming up that we're going to test to see what was in there by drilling down and taking sample. Some of this material they knew was hard crushed. So they devised these trucks to set over that and do this and then a, a scientist through the National Academy called and says, you best be careful. 
you have gas there and one silly spark and you've got an explosion that's about the size of 34 tons of TNT. And initially, when we first started, when the Yakima Nation first started to try to work with the Department of Energy, we said, do everything you can to prevent contamination of the, from these tanks. Because if you contaminate the region, the Yakima Nation has nowhere to go. Our culture is, is in the ground, through the foods and medicines, out of the river. And no one seems to really fully understand that my DNA, my genes, have been eating the salmon and the foods and medicines out of the ground for millennia. When I turned to Burger King and Kentucky Fried, I get diabetes. And so we are consistently try to, to determine how best to clean the site up. I didn't bring a map of the area, I will the next time, but it showed that our area of travel was to Canada, Western Montana, Arizona, California, and the coast. And then when Oregon and Washington became a territory, we had a 12 million acre reservation that reached from a little beyond Rainier, clear to past Walla Walla, up to Spokane, down south of the Columbia River. And we were forced into this treaty, Treaty of 1855. We were forced into it. And as a consequence then we were we were relegated to 1.3 million, 1.4 million acres here where we are now. But Hanford was put in our front yard without full consultation with the Yakma Nation. They talked to the Wana Pumps because the Wana Pumps are there. The Wana Pumps are not a federally recognized tribe. And as the problems continued to uh, harbor them and us, they finally joined the Yakima Nation. So we have this major issue down here of trying to determine how clean is clean, how to protect the foods and medicines that are there. Some only grows in the Hanford area. So I know I have limited time here, but we need to determine the eventual tribal law services. My program that I manage has a limited amount of funding. And with this austere times of the national budget, now with the sequestering, we are having a tough time trying to, do, trying to maintain our status by just having the staff there, mostly the administrative staff. We have four, five scientists down there at the Ritson area that work for us. But again, we just have enough funding to fund the staff and not have consultants like those that put this, these statistics together. I don't know how much more time I have, but I hope you have some questions for all of us when, when this is done. And so, um, the Yakima Nation is more than willing to work with anyone to try and make the public aware, make our own people aware, of the, the matters that we all face. It's disconcerting when you find that tritium and plutonium 239 
are the, tr are the trigger mechanisms of a weapon. They allow a stable trigger mechanism. Tritium has a basically small half-life. But as many of you know, plutonium-239 has a half-life of 24,000 years. And if you breathe in one microscopic speck of plutonium-239, you're guaranteed cancer. So, this is the, the major issues that we have, and I hope that you can put into your mind the, the future that you must look for to be aware of, and the coordination we need with each other to understand each other, we're all in the same boat. Thank you.